Um, it's now my great pleasure um, to introduce uh, the, a contributor to the Alison Chesney and Eddie Kaloran Memorial Lecture. Um, anyone who's really connected um, with the substance misuse field will need little introduction to Harry Shapiro. Um, in fact, there's probably not many people who would use a Neil Young song title uh, to, to cover such an interesting subject as this. It uh, reflects two of Harry's interests, I suppose, substance misuse and music. Uh, he's a well-published author. Uh, he's also become something of a fixture on um, the sofa for BBC News. Um, and he, it's well on his way to becoming a national treasure whenever anyone wants to discuss something to do with substance misuse. Um, he will be available to sign these later, I understand. But uh, please, Harry, the floor is yours. Thank you, and uh, well spotted on the Neil Young front. I wondered how many people would spot that. Um, I'm going to start by thanking Jerry Stimson and Paddy Costell for asking me to give this lecture. Um, I've been in the field now for some 38 years, believe it or not. And to be invited to do this particular lecture definitely counts as one of the highlights. Um, so I only hope I can, I can do justice to this honour. Eddie and Alison were legendary drugs workers in the field. Um, and I knew them well enough to be fully aware of their passion and commitment to helping those in society that few others actually care about. And they could be feisty and they could be combative um, in their different ways, but only in the service of doing their level best for service users. And if there was one thing they both hated, it was the discrimination, prejudice, ignorance, and even hatred directed against some of our most vulnerable citizens. And Russell Newcomb, the UK researcher and activist, I think is credited with first using the term harm reduction in an article published in Druglink magazine, edited by my good friend and colleague, Mike Ashton, who I think is still in the audience. And recently, Russell uh, went online asking for ideas uh, about a word to describe the hatred of drug users in the same way as we have homophobia, for instance. There wasn't any kind of conclusion to this exchange of ideas, but I quite like narcophobia because I don't see much hatred being directed at clubbers who come to grief through using ecstasy, for example. They're invariably portrayed as the victims of evil pushers who were sold them a rogue batch, to which my thought was, if only it had been a batch, as opposed to a rogue batch, things might have come out very different. In looking back over previous memorial lectures, nobody really has addressed this idea of stigma full on, as far as I can ascertain. And although I come at this from the point of view of an observer and a commentator, I suppose, rather than someone from lived experience, I do offer my thoughts as to the role of the media in fostering this fear and loathing, its impact on users and how we might go about beginning to try and fix it, address it. Now, as Dave has already pointed out, those of you who know your rock music will recognize this title as a, as a title of a Neil Young song. Um, he wrote it in memory of two of his band members who both died of heroin overdoses. But I'm going to kind of subvert the meaning of damage in this respect, to refer to instead the damage caused by individuals and their families of a hundred years of stigmatization of those with serious drug problems. And of course, the, the slime of n narcophobia has 
oozed its way into the lives of many sorts of drug users. But I think it's fair to say that the injecting heroin user rapidly became the archetypal drug fiend. I am by training and by inclination a historian. Uh, and so when I speak, it's likely you're going to have to put up with a history lesson. Um, but I'm not making any apologies this time because the story of drug fear goes back to the very earliest days of modern non-medical drug use. I think first, if I've got this right, quick word from our sponsor. Um, Drugwise is a, an online drug information service which I established in the wake of the demise of Drugscope, uh, which itself uh, continued on from the Institute for the Study of Drug Dependence. Uh, and I worked for both organisations. Drugwise went down in 2015. And I set this up with an, an ex-colleague of mine, and also some of you may be subscribers to DS Daily, uh, an online drug, alcohol, and tobacco news service. Plenty about e-cigarettes on, on DS Daily. Um, I'm still doing this. I'm still doing the 24-7 media work. And although it kind of can drive you nuts sometimes, I think it is worth, it is worth pursuing with trying to engage with the media at all different levels. Um, and yeah, my bum does appear on the couch at the BBC. Less so now when they try and get me to go all the way up to Salford for five minutes on the couch. And I'm really not prepared to do that. So I'll probably be less on the couch. But I do take a lot of time with student journalists, those on courses, uh, and those starting out on their career in the, in the hope, maybe vain, but maybe in the hope that some of what I've got to say will kind of percolate through. And I think it does sometimes. I'm quite encouraged by conversations I have with people who've heard me speak at, on City University's journalism course, um, now working all over the world. Uh, and they remember what I said, and they want to check up on stories. They actually want to check their facts before they go and print a story. So to some extent, you know, it's still worth doing that. And I'm also working. Uh, probably what, what I would call Britain's hidden drug problem in plain sight, which is about prescribed drugs, whether it's, whether it's opiate painkillers or benzodiazepines and antidepressants. So the first question really is, what is it when we talk about stigmatization? Well, there's a nice long quote here about what stigmatization is, but it pretty much boils down to what it says at the end there, that it's master status. It's what you're known as being. So you're not a mother, a father, a daughter, a fireman, an ex-soldier. Whatever you are, you are a drug user. You are a heroin addict. And that is, that is the label that is pinned on you. Pinned on you by society, but pinned on you also by the media. And the issue there was, well, why is the media so important? so important in the way we frame, the way we think about social issues, uh, and in particular this one. Well, it's worth bearing in mind that the general public, this is where we get most of our information. I mean, I'm horrified sometimes when I hear how wrong the media get it about drugs, because I always think, well, look about all the other things I don't know much about, you know. Brexit, global warming, the problems with antibiotics. I mean, all the stuff that's hurled at you all the time, and, and you don't really know. You just take it from the media. And if they're getting the things that you know about wrong, how much wronger are they getting the stuff that you don't know about? And you have to take a lot of this on trust. Um, because they also, I mean, the media will often, and I've had this conversation with journalists, and they say, well, you know, we're just feeding back to people what they believe already. And I suppose to some extent that that may well be true. But you've then actually got to ask, and hopefully I can begin to demonstrate, where do all these thoughts come from in the first place? Why is there apparent, collect, in this particular case, a collective hatred of people who use drugs? Um, and also the language in which everything is couched is crucial in the way conversations are framed. And at the same time as the media set 
set agendas, set frameworks, often in quite subtle ways. It's not necessarily in, in very direct and brutal ways, but it, it's subtle and it drip feeds over time. So there are certain media imperatives which you have to be aware of if you're trying to deal with the media at the very least. The first point is everything's immediate. Everything's now. They used to talk about newspapers being like tomorrow's chip paper. Well, we've got a 24-7 news cycle now. There's stuff coming all over the place. Stories can be old news literally a few hours after they've happened, let alone, let alone 24 hours. Obviously, everything has got to be dramatic. You know, you've never heard a newsreader go, well, in England today, not a lot happened. Uh, it, it just doesn't happen. I remember hearing a, 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 there was apparently a tornado in Birmingham uh, some while ago, and, and they interviewed somebody who was making great play about the fact, I think a wheelie bin got blown over, and it was about the, and they went on and on, and they were interviewing people about a roof tile came, you know, everything has to be dramatised, otherwise it basically isn't news. We have a cult of celebrity, clearly. Um, most drug stories uh, get most attention when celebrities are involved. I'm thinking Amy Winehouse, which of course turned out to be alcohol. Um, the media lost interest in that story immediately as soon as they found out it was alcohol. Believe you me, they did. Um, Robin Williams, Prince, Philip Seymour Hoffman, and so on. That's where, and they're often, these stories are often used as hooks to develop other drug stories, which can be an advantage, um, but it is far too celebrity focused. You have to keep it simple. And trying to get across some of the subtleties and nuances of the world in which we all operate in, in the addictions world, the, the complexities of what addiction is all about is nigh on impossible, particularly when you get the two minute sound bite. A journalist is very apologetic. You know full well, if you're doing a pre-record and it takes 15 minutes to record it, it's going to be blink and you miss it by the time it gets on BBC South News or Sky or wherever. So the imperative there is to get, try and get your messages in as quickly as possible. Of course, when it's live, they can't actually stop you. Um, but, but you still really don't get much time and you do have to try and explain synthetic cannabinoid agonists on Sky News in a very short space of time is a tricky ask. Um, it's always very voyeuristic, the news, about particularly around drug deaths and people who take them to hospital. And, Conservative there comes up in a capital C, but of course the conservative, we have a conservative media in, in to, to a large extent, and they're not open to particularly innovative and, and kind of liberal ideas. And it always has to be new. Um, and of course the press have been falling over themselves in the last year or so about legal highs in the UK. I still get journalists coming on to me asking me what's the situation with crystal meth. They are straining at the leash for a crystal meth epidemic in the UK and this goes back 10 years and this guy who I spoke to only last week, he, almost, he knew damn well what I was going to say. But he had to ask it anyway because his editor had told him to go and find out about what was happening with crystal meth. So I explained, well, fortunately, for all sorts of reasons, we don't appear to have a crystal meth epidemic in the UK, and I hope we never do. Um, so let's go back in time. This is, this is the biblical scapegoat, okay? And in ancient times... Um, this is what happened. People in times of famine and plague and the threat of invasion um, would send a goat out of a city into the desert as a way of trying to kind of appease the gods. Um, and this is where we get the, the expression scapegoat. Um, in ancient Greece, they took this one stage further. And if you happen to be a slave, a criminal, or someone who was disabled, um, you'd probably find yourself beaten up or stoned uh, for the same kinds of reasons. You became the city's scapegoat because of what was happening to the city. And interestingly, in ancient Greece, they were known as the poisoners, poisoners which in ancient Greece, Greek is pharmakos. So the pharmakos became the scapegoats for the city. Right, actually, not yet. Um, LAUGHTER 
leap forward several hundred years to the 19th century and, and the developments in medical science. Back at that time, medical science was pretty much in its infancy. It had, doctors had no idea why disease happened or how you sorted disease out. The only thing anyone could really deal with was the overriding symptom, which was pain. And in the 19th century, um, morphine and heroin and cocaine were first extracted from their plant base, uh, and, and the hypodermic syringe was perfected during this time as well. Uh, and so people began using opiates and cocaine in significant quantities, either through prescriptions from doctors, if you could afford it, and this was like the upper middle class in the world to do, and if you couldn't, you bought them uh, as patent medicines, which were often pure morphine or pure cocaine from your equivalent of your local grocery. I mean, this wasn't, uh, this was pre-chemist. Um, there were apothecaries, but, but there wasn't a proper industrial pharmaceutical industry at the time. So you could buy this stuff all over the place. And people did get addicted to, to a lot of this stuff, but it wasn't really taken much notice of. Um, if you did, you were kind of reckoned to have a sort of moral weakness. Um, it was a vicious indulgence. But there wasn't, you certainly weren't criminal, and you certainly weren't, um, you know, rejected from society or have, have you know, bad thoughts heaped upon your head. It was just like, well, okay, um, it's a shame, but there you go. Um, this all began to change as the century wore on, particularly in America, which saw a dramatic growth in urbanization, huge influx of, of immigrants, many of whom were living in, in, in extreme poverty in some of the large cities, Chicago, New York, and all the rest of it. And what that threw up was a kind of a, a, a moral outrage, I suppose, on behalf of, of reformers, faith groups. Um, there was the growth of the temperance movement, anti-gambling, anti-smoking, um, because of what people could see was going on in the cities. And then this general feeling of, um, of, of outrage uh, at, at these, what they were seen as hedonistic, destructive lifestyles, began to impose itself on drugs. And the reason was, it's because especially young people uh, in some of these cities were beginning to use drugs for non-medical purposes. Um, and this was frowned upon considerably, as you, quite imagine, as you can imagine. But there needed to be a kind of vehicle for the way people were, were reacting to drugs. And this is where this guy comes in. This is William Randolph Hearst. Uh, and he was um, a latter or, or a 19th century version of Rupert Murdoch. He was the first press magnate and also the model for Orson Welles's Citizen Kane. And he pretty much invented the tabloid press or the yellow journalism as it was called then because that was the colour of often the paper that the newspapers were printed on. And he embarked on a massive um, circulation war with, with other guys who were developing mass market circulation newspapers in America because the railways allowed, the development of the railways allowed newspapers to be live, delivered all over the country. And this was the main source of communication. And he soon realized that you could never underestimate um, what people would be prepared to read and what people would be prepared to pay money for. And he knew what sold newspapers. Uh, and drugs ticked all the buttons. It ticked. It ticked voyeurism. It ticked drama. It ticked young people in peril. And so you came up with headings like this in his newspapers. But he also knew that a picture told a thousand words. And he employed some very skilled graphic artists to um, illustrate the st stories, the drug stories in his newspapers. And they came up with this stuff. And this, this, in the late 19th and early 20th century, is the beginning of the iconography and symbolism of the drug fiend. 
and you can see exactly what images were being projected. The Grim Reaper, the vampire, skulls and crossbones, cross, skull and, and, and bones and graves and all the rest of it. So this, this was the image that, that recreational non-medical drug use was beginning to carry around its shoulders. Now this is Max Schreck. Now Max Schreck was the first cinematic vampire. It's a German film called Nosferatu that was made in 1922. At the time, um, part of a movement called Expressionism. And Berlin at that point was literally the drug capital of Europe in the 1920s after the First World War. Now you might think what I'm going to say now is stretching the point. However, the vampire became, in a sense, the archetypal drug fiend because he looked like the walking dead. He was the walking dead. He only came out at night. He was there to really infect others with, with this disease of undeadness. Um, his, he had sharp teeth that would pierce the skin and drew blood. And if you think this is all pushing the analogy a little bit far, just wait for a couple of headlines that I've got coming up. And then, of course, there was another, there was another, um, what shall we say, another symbolism entirely. And this was less to do with, with the supernatural and more to do with, with race and more to do with, with racism, and more to do with not so much what drug you were using, but who you actually were. So, for example, in 1916, 100 years ago, if you picked up the Harrods catalogue, you will see adverts for morphine and, heroin, uh, morphine and cocaine, and a suggestion that customers, Harrods customers, send some morphine and cocaine to the front to give their boys a bit of a lift. Boys, in this case, almost certainly being probably the officer class. Certainly, they weren't the Tommies on the front line. At the same time, the government introduced the first laws against recreational drug use in the UK because of a lot of newspaper stories, fairly hysterical newspaper stories, about about frontline working class lads coming home on leave, going down the West End for a good time, and being sold coke by prostitutes. And that was how we got the first drug laws in the UK that eventually became part of the Dangerous Drugs Act. Same kind of thing really happened in America. Uh, slaves on the plantation and slaves working the dock were given cocaine to make them work longer and eat less. Once emancipation came along, they became the cocaine fiends out to rape any white woman they could lay their hands on. Um, and actually, the, leaping forward to 1957, there was an article in the Times about cannabis in the UK, which said that it wasn't so much, the drug itself wasn't that dangerous. And this is in 1957. What was really dangerous was the cannabis culture was encouraging white girls to mix with black guys. So it was, it was all about race. It was, in fact, less to do with the drugs. In this particular case, it, certainly in, a, in America, there was a lot of anti-Chinese feeling because they'd come over and built the railways, then there was a depression, and it was like, ooh, they'd come over here to steal our jobs, and where have we heard that one before? Um, and so therefore, it was built up that, that the Chinese were, were running uh, opium dens, and the only reason they were running opium dens was to entice young white girls in and sell them into slavery. Um, and this manifested itself in the novels of Sax Roma, uh, and the evil, inscrutable Fu Manchu, portrayed here by Christopher Lee. Um, and so you begin to build up that, um, that racial profiling in terms of, of drug users who are to be feared. Which is interesting, actually, because before about the 17th century, Chinese didn't smoke opium. Um, the only, and it wasn't actually part of their culture. The only reason they got into smoking opium is because they were pushed it by the world's first drug cartel, courtesy of the British East India Company. 
who smuggled, pushed opium into China from India. Um, wrong way? Okay. And then we get into the 1920s and 30s uh, and, uh, and reefer madness. You can see up in that top corner there, you've got that same vampire kind of image. Um, and only this, in this particular case, it was less Chinese immigrants and more Mexican immigrants who come across the border as a result of the war with Spain. And even to this day, quite recently, you've still got people like Donald Trump talking about Mexicans and the only reason they want to come across the border is to sell us drugs. So that kind of sensibility uh, takes a long, you know, doesn't die easy. So what threat are the media trying to suggest that drug users actually pose? Well, as we've seen, there's this whole image of, of the supernatural, something that you, you really do have to be afraid of. There's an element, of course, of xenophobia, whether it's Chinese or Mexicans, and drugs coming from abroad, although, of course, in those days, the drugs weren't coming from abroad. They're being processed in laboratories in the UK and in America. There was a threat to young people. Um, and that was really a proxy in America anyway for an emerging nation. This drugs threatened the future of the nation as embodied by our young people. And also, of course, a threat to family. And it was a kind of line in the sand particularly cannabis. It was a line in the sand beyond which we're not going to put up with it. So if we just look at the views of addiction uh, over a period of time, as I said, in the, the Victorian view was, from a medical point of view, if you've been prescribed laudanum or anything like that and you became addicted, it was pretty much deemed to be a moral weakness. And this developed, when it was non-medical, into the notion of the drug fiend. In between the wars, particularly after the development of things like Alcoholics Anonymous, you began to get the idea that this was to do with individual pathology, that you had a disease. Um, this, whether it was genetic or constitutional or whatever, this, this business of either alcoholism or drug addiction was embodied within you. And in fact, I think it's worth saying that there was a lot of talk throughout the early part of the century, and still, I suppose, about the demon drink, as opposed to the drug fiend. And I take that to mean that the view was that the evil, in a sense, was embodied in the alcohol. Whereas if you talk about a drug fiend, it feels like the evil is embodied in the person not necessarily in the drugs that they're using. And then, then after the war, you began to get a, a much broader view of addiction, and it, whether it was through alcohol or drugs, and the idea that there were, there were other factors at work. There were social, economic factors at work. It wasn't necessarily all embodied within a weak-minded a weak -minded individual. But this didn't necessarily play itself out. I'm going to switch now from media to, because we talk about media, media is not just the newspapers, it's also film. Um, one of the first genuine attempts to try and portray addiction was this film that came out in 1955, Man with a Golden Arm, um, Frank Sinatra. Um, and the thing about these films was that you, Although it was a serious attempt to look at addiction, because up to, then, up to that point, you pretty much weren't allowed to discuss drugs in movies at all, because there was no classification system. There was no 18 or A or U or X or any of that, so it meant anyone could see any film. And in America, it got ridiculous, because every state had different laws. So you could show your film in one state, but you couldn't show it in another. And I think it was in Maryland, you couldn't show a woman knitting baby clothes. And the reason you couldn't show a woman knitting baby clothes was because the implication was she must have had sex in order to be knitting baby clothes. So it used to drive filmmakers up the wall trying to find out where they could show their films. But eventually, what was known as the Hayes Code, which defined what you could and couldn't show, 
if you, if you defied the Hayes Code, what it meant was you couldn't show your film in the nice, posh cinemas in the big cities. You had to show it in places like sort of Dog Breath, Indiana, um, because no other big cinema would take it. Well, the director of this movie basically threw two fingers up to the Hayes Code and said, I'm going to show my film wherever I like. And this was the film that broke the mould in terms of film censorship. But, and the but is that within dramatic structure, the rules about drama, the big rule about drama is get into the story quickly. Don't have exposition. Don't do lots of backstory. People want to see the main character and where they're at in the story. And the more dramatic you start the story, the better. So we don't want to know how things got to be where they're. If you want to throw a bit of exposition in later on, fine. But otherwise, people will just switch off. And the same applies to novels, but particularly in, book, in, in films. So you never really find out how Frankie Machine, as it was called, because he was also a drummer. Not all drummers are heroin addicts, obviously. Um, <laughs> and I say that for those of you who happen to know that I played drums in a band called the Sensational Hit Soul Band. But moving on, um, you never find out how we got into that position. You never find out the context. And the same has gone all the way through, pretty much all the way through the films that try to portray addiction. So one of Al Pacino's first big roles was in a film called Panic in Needle Park. Um, Leonardo DiCaprio in The Basketball Diaries. Matt Dillon in Drug School, Cow Drug Store Cowboy. And Ewan McGregor in Trainspotting. All great films, but no context. So all you're left with is this individual pathology, this bad person, sad person, mad person, whatever, in this situation and what happens to them. And sometimes they die, and sometimes they recover in various ways that are never clear, um, but you never get anything like the full picture. And just stepping back into the 60s, um, you get the same iconography with a completely different drug. So this is fear of the devil, LSD. Uh, in a sense, you wouldn't expect anything else because this was a whole genre of exploitation B-movies that ran in, the, ran in America during this time. Um, but even in a film like this, um, which was the first... It's easy, right? I'm sure you know this. I don't really have to say that, but I am anyway, in case you don't recognize it. Um, basically, the first stoner movie, the, the first movie that, that people of that generation could actually see themselves on screen and somehow relate to what was going on. But even in, even in this film, um, so spoiler alert coming up if you haven't seen it, um, the LSD trip that they go on doesn't end well. And for these two guys at the end of the film, it doesn't end well. So there wasn't even really any sort of particular celebration of drug culture, even in a film like this. What pressure there may have been from distributors, I, I don't know. Maybe the cinemas wouldn't have shown it, and the censors wouldn't have passed it if it hadn't had this particular denouement. And so it goes on, all the way through the 70s, and 80s, and 90s, until we get to this film, which was released in 2000. It's called Traffic, with Michael Douglas as the Prime Minister. And I think probably for the first time, the whole notion of how drug users are treated, whether what the drug war was all about, and whether it was worth fighting, and what the hell are we doing with all of this, was actually given some Hollywood cinematic exposition. And at one point, Michael Douglas is sitting on a plane, either flying somewhere, with he's got all his advisors with him, and he's saying, come on, what are we going to do about this? Um, has anyone got any ideas? And, oh, where's treatment? Is there anyone here representing treatment? And the answer was no. There was no one representing treatment on that plane. And he makes a speech about the drugs war actually being a civil war against their own children, not least because in the film his daughter hooks up with someone and finishes up uh, uh, on heroin. And I think this film was actually shown to some 
um, UNODC diplomats out in the Far East. They had a special showing of this film uh, when, it was, when it was released. And then there's this, which I'm sure most of you will be familiar with. And again, it was much more of a long form, really, uh, and, and dealt very much with the, with the drug scene in Baltimore. Uh, and there was a famous section where, where, the, where the police chief in that particular area decided to let drug users congregate in one place, and they called it Amsterdam because that's what they thought was going on in Amsterdam. Naturally, the guy lost his job and, and all the rest of it. But all the way through that series, the creator, David Simon, was trying to make a point about the... Um, the, the, the dead end, really, that a lot of drug policy was running into. And I've got to put this in simply because it is my favourite press headline. I mean, as if Osama bin Laden wasn't bad enough, um, he has to be involved in a drug plot as well, just in case you didn't realise just how bad he really was. Um, and just going back to what I said before about my vampire analogy, if you think it was stretching a point. It really, I don't think, is stretching a point. This is fairly recent headlines from the Daily Mail, of course. Um, and this one, although frames come, this is from an Irish newspaper, um, and you can just about see the phrase "Walking Dead" at the bottom of that, at the bottom of that news cutting. So, so what? Okay. So the media are nasty to people. They're nasty to all sorts of people. So what's the big deal here? You know, why is this important? And I think it's important. And here are a couple of other people who think it's important. There's no arm of British healthcare which has been so perverted by politics as the treatment of drug users. And that was Nick Davis in 2001, a Guardian journalist. No doctor gets into trouble for neglecting addicts, vilifying them or causing them suffering. And this is Dr. Anne Daly, who herself ran into trouble with the General Medical Council for the way she was prescribing to uh, heroin users. In fact, got struck off. Um, and beyond that, it's all this. I get angrier as I get older. And this stuff makes me angry. You can read it, we can drug test you, we can charge you with a criminal offence if you refuse the test, we can deny you medication, we can make you take your medication in public, we can deny you a job, a house, we can imprison you, and basically we can do what we damn well like, because nobody cares. Well, okay, and that that is re what I would call reinforcement. And I remember speaking to some guys when Drugscope was doing a, um, what do you call it, a kind of road show, that's the word. We were doing a road show around the area. And there were some, there were some service users in some of the audiences. And I, and I asked them, I said, doesn't this upset you? Doesn't this get you angry? And one of them said to me, well, that's what we are. We're junkies. And, and this, this, I think, shows you the um, iniquities of exactly what the media can do to people over a long period of time. Now, obviously, some people do care. Uh, I mean, over the years, there have been many doctors, nurses, frontline drug workers who've really gone the extra mile to try and help people in trouble. Of that, there is no doubt. And more widely, users themselves, in increasing numbers, have been taking up the mantra of nothing about us without us. Now, there are many stories of individual recovery. Some people have become CEOs of major drug treatment agencies, charities, using their former street smarts to grow businesses turning over millions of pounds. And much more modest personal achievements, people who've gone through the traditional, um, traditional route from street to community drug service to rehab and beyond, and gone on to live the same life with all its ups and downs as everybody else. 
This is what I would call the long-standing quiet recovery, the personal triumphs, the stories of individual courage, which have been going on for decades and far longer than recovery small r became recovery large r in British drug policy of recent years. But what I'm referencing here is what I call the less quiet voices. That group of people from across the world collectively known as user advocates, activists, often but not necessarily still using street drugs or in receipt of services or both. Starting in 1973 with the concerned methadone patient group in New York City and the Dutch junkie bond during the 1980s, groups of user activists have mobilized at a local, national and international level. They've campaigned on a range of different issues around treatment advocacy, human rights, civil liberties and law reform. Of course, with any activist movement, there are numerous stresses and strains. Different agendas, views and opinions, and what I call a desperate democracy, where a hundred people are all sitting in a room trying to construct a document, and I've been in rooms where that has happened. Um, and trying to collectively work out a consensus. So sometimes it can feel a little bit like that. Um, for those of you who are familiar with your life of Brian. And I think it actually can be extra hard for user activists who may have spent years on the streets taking care of business, being at the same time entrepreneurial, suspicious, looking after number one, playing any sort, any number of power games, as well as maybe being unwell for much of the time and coming off the streets and sitting around tables with tea and biscuits trying to forge organisations often underfunded and with the participants pretty much lacking in the training of terms of governments and or governance and organizational structure and some of these organizations I think have been set up to fail and, and I'm quite suspicious along with others of this term user involvement uh, I think it can be a Weasley phrase uh, and it can mean everything and it can mean nothing I feel the same way about the unintended consequences of drug policy. Some of those unintended consequences, I think, are actually intended, or at very, the very least, uh, not unwelcome. The most successful outcomes in this respect, I think, have taken place where activists have teamed up with sympathetic professionals, more able to offer a bridge into policy and practice mainstream. One of the best examples in the UK was the Methadone Alliance. Um, a partnership with what I would call the UK's godfather of advocacy, Bill Nellis, uh, working in th with support of people like Chris Ford and John Strang, or Sir John Strang, as I should actually now call him. Um, and according to Bill, also Mike Trace, then the deputy drug czar. I think the tireless work of Matt Southwell is to be, com to be commended. And all those people who were putting together user voice publications like Monkey, User Voice, Black Poppy, uh, and also my colleagues in the room from DDN, who have obviously done some sterling work in relationship to giving users a legitimate voice. And there are many others that I could mention. Uh, and I think that role of honor threads out across the world, greatly facilitated these days by the opportunities for networking afforded by the internet. But for me, and I'm not sure if this was a first, but it, it would count as a bit of a landmark, was at the United Nations Special Assembly meeting in 1988 when Marsha Burnett, a user activist, was allowed to speak from the public gallery. And this is a short edited version of what she had to say, and I'm going to read it. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, she said, and thank you for allowing me to address you here today. My name is Marsha, and I'm a recovering addict living with HIV disease. I'm a 43-year-old mother of four children, two of whom are still in foster care in the state of Vermont. I'm in process of getting my children back by September. I've been drug-free since 1991, so that was seven years, and I bring my experiences to all the activism I'm, I'm involved in. First of all, if we really care about the pain, suffering, and isolation of addicted drug users, we must be willing to listen to what they say they need, 
It's a fact that some of the most useful strategies used to reduce or try and eliminate the death, disease and crime associated with this level of drug use were designed by drug users themselves. But user participation is not possible while we are prosecuted for being users. I decided to come here today to tell you how the war on drugs directly affects my life and the lives of countless others in the hope that we might all be willing to reconsider the repressive drug policy paradigm which has been the norm for decades around the world. So as an ex-user myself living with AIDS, I would appeal to you to reconsider your current drug policies. Is universal needle exchange really a lot to ask for, given the fact that we would pre be preventing so much dis decimating illness amongst us and not only bur and not burdening societies with enormous public health bills? Is it really too much to ask? And before I end, I want to say this. We are not asking you to condone drug use. We're simply saying that current policies are not working for the good of all humanity, and therefore we would ask you to be open to a more thorough debate on the subject matter. Is it really okay in your heart, and I underline that personally, in your heart if we sacrifice the lives of millions of people at the altar of economic and military interests? But it's a long haul. As recently as 2009, I was in a civil society meeting in Vienna. This is me now. Sadly, I don't think Marsha was alive still by 2009. I think she'd passed away by then. And civil society is the expression I kind of look a bit sideways at sometimes. Um, there were drug activists there who were making the case for human rights and, and, and civil liberties on behalf of their community. But this was accompanied by literal gasps of outrage, mainly from US government-funded NGOs, who refused to accept the idea that people who use drugs had any human rights. And as far as I'm concerned, the subtext of that for me was, how can subhumans have human rights? The International Narcotics Control Board and the UNODC have recently adopted the language of human rights yet the murder of drug users in the Philippines appears to go on with impunity. Just to go back to David Simon and the wire and the issue of law reform. He gave a Guardian lecture and was interviewed by the Guardian and he became something of a bit of a poster boy really for legalisation. But he said I don't support legalisation just so that middle class white kids can smoke dope with impunity. That's not what this is all about. What it was all about for him was to do something about the tens of thousands of young black guys that were banged up in America for non-violent drug offences, most being cannabis possession. That was what it was all about for him. And it's the same for me, I think having had time to think about this since Drugscope went belly up over a year ago. I don't care about city bankers in the streets around here snorting coke in posh pubs and clubs and bars. That's not what it's about for me. Our laws send out messages as to what society does and does not approve of. And I think the history of gay rights in the UK is a case in point. When David Cameron announced his resignation as Prime Minister a few weeks ago, he specifically named gay, gay marriage as a part of his legacy that he wanted to be remembered for, that he was proud of. And if you wind the clock back exactly 50 years ago to 1966, men having sex with men was a criminal offence. But I would contend that nothing has been achieved, nothing could have been achieved between 1966 and 2016 if we'd not had the Sexual Offences Act 1967, which legalised sex between men consulting adults over the age of 21 because it sent out a message and all that followed. And that, I have to say, was a top down political initiative. There were no focus groups. There were no nudge units at number 10 trying to find a way of getting people to accept this. 
And there absolutely bloody wasn't any referendum either, because it probably wouldn't have passed. Um, it was driven by a top-down political will, including from people like Tom Dryberg MP, who had exactly the same kind of conflict of interest that Keith Baz was accused of a few weeks ago. In the UK, we have media commentators like Peter Hitchens and Melanie Phillips who believe they have captured the moral high ground on drugs simply by declaring drug use just plain wrong and bad. When two opposing views are engaged in a fight for public support, it is often said that it's a battle for the hearts and the minds. And at the moment, to be perfectly honest, in the UK anyway, I don't see much evidence of the mind bit in terms of law reform being that convinced and very effective. Arguments about tax benefits, sideswiping organised crime, or simply saying the drugs war has failed because people are still using drugs, it doesn't seem as yet to have had much traction. And I think a good reason why it hasn't is because, and I keep saying 100 years, because it's 1916 since those first laws were imposed, and we're now in 2016, because of 100 years of anti-drug user propaganda, which has effectively injected that sentiment and those feelings into the body politic. So alongside things like support don't punish, which is clearly making an impact, as we heard from Jamie before, maybe the reform movement needs to try and articulate some kind of new narrative and in a sense launch an assault on the moral high ground and aim for the heart rather than the mind. But as part of that campaign, I think we should turn our attention to the media. I'm coming to an end now. Nearly done. In February 2011, Ian Doherty of the Irish Independent, which is the country's largest circulation broadsheet, went on a rant. He's a columnist. And he suggested that heroin users should be sterilised. And he called them, and I quote, vermin and feral, worthless scumbags. A coalition of national and international services and organisations complained to the Irish press ombudsman, and they won. The Ombudsman ruling in May 2011 that what Doherty had written was likely to cause offence to and stir up hatred against those addicted to drugs. Now that may have been a world first, I don't know, but it sounds pretty powerful to me. And I think it would come as a big shock to proprietors, editors and journalists the world over if they were challenged on every front about their reporting and their ingrained assumptions about drug users. And in doing so, and maybe this is the start of another campaign, I don't know, but doing so on a global basis may begin to establish the principle of narcophobia and begin to roll back 100 years of hate. Thank you very much. <laughs>